Do you remember steering Obi-Wan like the Millennium Falcon, spamming random guards for grenades, Qui-Gon Jinn's shuffle, and Yoda looking like a blurry gremlin? <laughs> Then, like me, you played through Star Wars Obi-Wan. But what makes it so special? Well, to answer that question, we have to head back to December 2001, when the beloved Jedi was still an Obi-Padawan Kenobi. That's actually hilarious. Star Wars Obi-Wan was one of four games that released in the two years since The Phantom Menace made its way to box office, where you play as Mr. High Ground himself. While Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace and Jedi Power Battles released to middling reviews, but to far better fan reception, and the adventures of Obi-Wan allowed you to play as a pixelated squid that keeps inking oh, you guys made me eat. Star Wars Obi-Wan was relatively overlooked due to its exclusivity to the then brand new Xbox console that had only launched in the US a month prior to the game's release. That's fascinating. Whilst the original plan was to see this game, titled then as Episode 1 Obi-Wan, released on PC, apparently it was George Lucas himself that decided to shift the project to the Xbox due to the limitations of PC hardware at the time. Oh, how times have changed. The PC port? It's garbage! One strange aspect of the game's exclusivity on the Xbox was that it meant the branding and cover art had to scream exclusive. How did they achieve that? Well, by using this monstrosity right here. Now, I know that Obi-Wan is an Xbox exclusive, so showing him holding a blue lightsaber would have been off-brand, but was this really the best they could do? The green glow and everything makes it look like young Ben here is going to have a sick. <laughs> Star Wars Obi-Wan acts as a companion piece to Episode 1, dipping in and out of the film's plot whilst adding a lot of its own touches. So the game begins and we get that very familiar opening title crawl, which, as we Star Wars fans know, is a cardinal sin to skip, and travel to Lower Coruscant to deal with some criminals known as the Black Heath that have held up a transport. Some of these death animations are absolutely brilliant. Who would have thought that being hit by a lightsaber would launch an enemy so high into the air? Your lightsaber acts more like the glowing baseball bat that we've become familiar with in Disney sequels. What sets this Star Wars adventure apart is the use of the right thumbstick to operate your Jedi weapon. Flicking the stick left or right swings the lightsaber horizontally, whilst flicking up swings it overhead. Simple enough, but still unique for the time. Think ape escape, but with lightsabers. So you deal with the criminals, free the transport, and then it's off to stand in front of the council. In between some of the missions, you'll face off against various opponents in the arena. It's an opportunity to test your skills or spam force push and smack your opponents while they're lying down. But this first arena is where I learned one of the most sacred Jedi techniques that few have mastered. The Reverse Speed Crouch Walk. I cannot believe this is a thing. When moving forward, Obi-Wan's crouch walk is slow and methodical, but go backwards and he goes quicker than Jabba when he's fixated on a new prisoner. So you quickly dispatch the training droid and head back out into Coruscant to infiltrate a Black Heath hideout. So you arrive at the hideout and apparently this is a stealth mission. Basically, you have to make it to an informant without raising an alarm. Sound the alarm! Intruder! However, seeing as there's no real way to be properly stealthy, you can just slice your way through the enemies. Just make sure to attack the droid that goes for the alarm and you're all set. This level teaches you something very important about Star Wars Obi-Wan. Ledges are your friend. Some enemies are too annoying to deal with, so if you can line them up with a ledge, a quick force push will do the trick. So you make your way deeper into the hideout, kill everyone in your way, finally make it to the informant, Damn it. finally make it to the informant, and Obi-Wan shows the highest level of disinterest in his information. They are receiving large shipments of arms and plan on turning Coruscant into a war zone. Let's go. Okay. The information then leads young Kenobi to a landing platform where the Black Heath are doing some shady business. I just can't take Obi-Wan seriously. His voice acting sounds like a parody version of Obi-Wan that is suffering from congestion. Master, someone has just arrived. I can't make out their species, but they must be the arms dealers. So you slice your way through the street gang over and over again till a boss shows up, which you also make quick work of and leave him lying in the cold, and it's back to the council. What is going on with Obi-Wan's face here? It's like the devs didn't even try to make him look accurate. He looks like he would fit in as one of the Kens in the Barbie movie. Hi, Ken. Hello there. Ooh, yeah. Yes! Now it's back into the Saber Arena to face off against Sayasi. Tin? You know, that Jedi Master that sits around a lot till he gets sliced up by the Senate? I am the 
Senate. It doesn't take too long to overpower Master Tin, though I do wonder why I can smack him repeatedly with a lightsaber and he just hops back up. Anyway, it's off to the Jinha outpost. This is the first of few missions where you will be following Qui-Gon around as he aimlessly trots around the area, trying to find the way forward. You also get to see the first of his incredible dance moves, the Jedi Moonwalk. He also freaks out if you go slightly off course. Not that it's easy to tell where you're supposed to even go. Even when you go in the right direction, but take a slightly different path, Qui-Gon just can't handle it. Come on! Also, I don't know what happened to Qui-Gon's face, but I think he might have made a trip to Mustafar. We'll make it to a blown up ship and then split up. The Minds of Obradan has to be one of the most annoying missions in the whole game. This was the introduction of the annoying Jinha enemies with swords that just won't seem to die. But at least we get our first experience of a droid attempting to run away. I don't know if he's running a marathon or just going for a jog, but this made me laugh every damn time. Also, did anyone else have trouble with this section back in the day? I could never figure out how to get down to the bottom of this chamber, and when I had looked at the guide, it gave some really finicky and precise platforming that was honestly so easy to mess up. How is it that Obi Flippin Kenobi can be kicked off a ledge and survive, but here, if you drop down anything more than a few feet, he just gives up on life. The only way I found to get down here was to jump very precisely onto this door frame and then hang off it to land on the ground without hurting the poor Padawan. Tell me in the comments if there is a better way, because honestly, this solution is not straightforward at all. So you weave through the corridors and finally make it to the objective and sit through more brilliant voice acting from Obi-Wan. Master, I think I found the Cortosis refinery. There's some strange technology here, some kind of synthesis device. So you deactivate the refinery and then basically do the previous mission in reverse as you now have to escape the mines by the exact route that you just came in. There's honestly not much to it. Jump over some lava pits, fight some guards, and make your way to the exit where you meet up with Qui-Gon Jinn, Plo Koon, and Darth Maul's pale twin to make quick work of what enemies are left. Then Qui-Gon puts his back out. My back. Oh, my back. And it's time to go back once again to the council. Proceed to the training arena where you will receive training. <laughs> Wait, I have to go to the training arena to receive training? Well, thanks for clarifying that for me, Master Windu. Or should I say Master Window? Because he falls through a window. Do you not get it, people? His name was Windu and he went out a window, huh? That joke was hilarious and you all liked it. <laughs> Did you know that the Empire is watching you? They want to send your data to shady individuals like him in exchange for some credits so that they can build their next Death Star. Every time you browse the web, whether at home or out at the cantina, your data is vulnerable to being extracted straight from your data pad. But thankfully, you can disrupt these attempts with private internet access. PIA encrypts your internet connection to prevent those bucketheads from getting access to your sensitive information. But that's not all. BIA enables you to access region lock content from all over the galaxy, so you never miss a show from your favorite streaming service. What sets this apart from other VPNs is that you only need one subscription to protect all of your devices. So go to piavpn.com forward slash the beta network to get 83% off a two year subscription with an additional two months free. It's time for another run in the Saber Arena, but this time with Plo Koon. I'm starting to think that these doors are just padding out this game at this point. If it presented as an opportunity to gain a new skill each time you entered the arena, and this would feel much more worthwhile rather than just a bit of a time waster. Anyway, defeating Plo Koon is pretty straightforward, then it's off to some very short negotiations. This is where the game really kicks into gear. This is indeed the start of The Phantom Menace, though slightly varied to the version in the official Episode 1 game and a bit more drawn out too. It opens with Qui-Gon looking like a discount Voldemort, <laughs> dispensing some wisdom about the Force while sporting a nose that would make a Sith Lord question their life choices. The feeling of slicing through battle droid after battle droid is truly satisfying. I love the fact that depending on how you swing your lightsaber, droids will be cut in half in different ways. Sometimes you may just take the head, other times it might be straight through the middle, Darth Maul style. These are some brave droids. Even after disarming them, they will still punch on with you whilst you slice through them. I don't know whose idea that was, but give this man a raise. This was just way too funny. Qui-Gon Jinn even serves up some more signature dance moves with the Qui-Gon Shuffle. So you see your ship in flames, dismantle the controls to a turret, clamber through some vents, and then reach the iconic moment where Qui-Gon melts some steel. Also, Qui-Gon clearly forgot how to block blasters because, man, does he take an absolute pelting here. You make it to Naboo. Oh, wait. 
No, you don't. Apparently, there was more to squeeze out of this Trade Federation ship section, but instead, now you are on one of the fleet carriers. There really isn't much to this level. Go into a room, kill some droids, go into the next room, kill more droids, and repeat. That's literally it. Now you actually make it to Naboo. And so far, the game has done a decent job of pretending that both Anakin and Jar Jar Binks don't even exist. Not one trace of them. So you run around, kill some more droids, float in the air, because why not? And this is where you learn that whilst Obi-Wan might be a Jedi, that doesn't mean he can't go on a murder spree of his own. What is it with LucasArts and giving us the freedom to murder? I'm pretty sure that's not the Jedi way. But yeah, if you've had enough of the Naboo officers, just take aim and swing. So you do more of the same and find the entrance to the palace through some random stairs below a waterfall. Once inside, you're met with one of the most irritating characters in the game. Pleased to meet you. I'm Asha. <laughs> You get rid of the droids and begin a long slug where you have to follow Asha, then protect her, then follow her, then protect her. I swear she always gets herself in the line of fire. Remember what I said about killing anyone and everyone? Well... The funny thing is, Qui-Gon doesn't even seem to be concerned that Obi-Wan just massacred one of the Queen's guard. Obi-Wan, you failed. Your fear clouded your thoughts. Sorry, my mentor. <laughs> I have failed you. So you follow the ugly cretin through a series of corridors and rooms through the palace and finally get to ditch her to go searching for the queen. This next level feels much like a rehash of City Under Siege. You run around a semi-open area while slicing through droids. You keep interrupting guards to get more grenades all the while having Obi-Wan say some random bits of dialogue. Hello, hello. Jedi, hello. Do, do you need more grenades? Here you go. My language. Hello. I'm not sure. You make your way deeper into the palace and meet up with Qui-Gon just in time to initiate the iconic surprise attack from episode one, only this time round much less gracefully. Oh, and you get another round of the Qui-Gon shuffle. And did you know that the queen morphs into bricks when she dies? Queen has been killed. Our mission here is a failure. What did she die from now? Heartbreak? So you rescue the queen, head to Tatooine, and now the game takes a real sidestep. Whilst Qui-Gon is off acquiring spare parts for the ship, the Queen has somehow gotten kidnapped by the Tusken Raiders and Obi-Wan has to go rescue her. There was clearly a lot of originality going into this mission objective. Hey, you saved the Queen, but we need to buy some time whilst Qui-Gon meets the Youngling Slayer, so go save her again. There is an exceptional amount of padding in these next few levels as you scour sand dunes to find the Queen. Oh, so that's where Anakin learned it from. Maybe he was more of a Jedi than we thought. So you go on a slaughter spree of the Tusken Raiders and then head deep into their encampment, only to be met by more, so obviously, more slaughtering. Honestly, if there's anything left for Anakin, I would be surprised. This mission was a bit of a surprise. I did not expect to come up against the Tusken Raider Chief that has never skipped Arm Day. This fight was actually a little challenging at first. Each of the Chief's attacks can completely melt your health bar, making this fight shorter than the negotiations with the Trade Federation. This is impossible! However, there is a way to completely break this fight. When the Chief jumps down, immediately force the big candelabra looking thing in the middle of the room into him. This sets him on fire and chips away at his health. Move away from him and do the same. Do this about four to five times with the occasional lightsaber strike in the mix and he's finished. Obi-Wan then celebrates his victory by becoming the king of the raiders apparently. And now it's back to the council. You're all right there, Master Windu. Do you need to see a specialist? We're back in the arena once again, this time to face Mace Windu and finally prove that Obi-Wan is worthy of being a Jedi Knight. This was definitely one of the trickiest runs in the arena as not only is Mace Windu unaffected by the Force, but he's also much more aggressive and can toss you around with the Force himself. But after a few smart moves, you defeat him and it's time to return to Naboo. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There really isn't much more I can say here. It's run through the same palace, kill the same droids, rescue the same people, but this time at night, and with more exploding kamikaze droids. Midway through the level, this becomes an escort mission as you escort hostages back through the way you just came. So yeah, you basically go from one end of the level to the other, turn around and head right back. It's honestly pretty tedious. And Asha's back. So Naboo magically turns back into daytime and you traverse one last time through the palace and take out a big gun so the pilots can reach the hangar. Kill the droids, explore the area, take down the droidicas, sorry, destroyers, and then we can take the cannon down and it's on to the hangar. Okay, so this I can get behind. The setup is that you arrive at the hangar bay just before you meet this horny toad and you have to clear the area of enemies whilst closing down all entry points to the hangar. Admittedly, I completely forgot that on my first attempt and waddled around aimlessly till the resistance 
assistants died. But this mission is pretty quick and honestly a heap of fun. This guy plays bongos to get the shields down and then you smack each power generator to close the doors. So the pilots manage to escape the hangar and Darth Maul rocks up looking like he has a sinus infection. The next level opens near the end of the door. Darth Maul and Qui-Gon swipe at each other a few times and Qui-Gon does his best Joe Biden impression. <laughs> You then wait for a while, the shield drops, and it's time to slice up Darth Maul. This fight was a bit of fun. It had a degree of challenge to it, but you could still get quite a few hits in. What's clever was that Darth Maul had two health bars. The first for when he's fighting with his double-sided lightsaber, and another for when he's down to just one blade. So you deplete his health bar, he randomly goes gliding backward, and then he falls down the shaft whilst perfectly sliced like a loaf of bread. The ending cutscene has you returning to Padme's ship, and oh hey, here's Anakin. Where on earth did you come from? I can't help but laugh at how still everyone else is. Like, there is no movement at all, aside from young Ben muttering to himself whilst his new apprentice- Whoa, slow down, Anakin. Don't have to run toward your cremation that quickly. Oh, I hate you. So the end credits roll and there's more? Obi-Wan is giving some extra spiel whilst clearly smoking another death stick. This is absolutely bizarre. I was not expecting anything post credits, especially not a drunken ramble from Obi-Wan. She was sitting in Jabba's throne room, watching mind-numbing dancers stuffing green tubers into your mouth. So was this the original high ground? Hey guys, post-editing Sam here. Uh, it took me forever to realize that actually this was a train spotting reference. Upon rewatching it, I finally connected the dots. So that is just really bizarre bizarre, but actually kind of awesome. However, we aren't quite done yet. There are now a few bonus stages available that were unlocked throughout the main campaign. They are all just fights in the Saber Arena. So for a very quick summary, you face Depa Balaba in the arena, you beat Depa Balaba in the arena, you face Kiari Mundi in the arena, you beat Kiari Mundi in the arena, you face Darth Maul's Pale Twin in the arena, you beat Darth Maul's Pale Twin in the arena, and so on. What I didn't expect to see was the final bonus mission. Simply titled as Battle Royale, this particular battle arena does exactly what you might expect. A bunch of Jedi in one arena smacking each other with their practice lightsabers. Whilst this was a bit of fun at first, it was such a pain as it seemed like everyone but Qui-Gon will target you. So being the brave Jedi that I am, I jumped up onto the ledge and ran around the outskirts and occasionally got a swipe in. Finally, it's down to just you and your master. And now you have to do your best to replicate Darth Maul's work. But that's not all. There is also an option called Jedi Battle, which is this game's versus mode. It's two player only. And if like me, you have no friends, then it's really hard to have fun with this mode. Unless you're happy to plug in a vacant second controller and wail on an idle opponent. So you get to pick which arena to fight in and it's time to slice up a very still Padawan. It's time for Obi-Wan to get a taste of his own medicine. Star Wars Obi-Wan is definitely a strange outlier in the universe of Star Wars games. Its release date and console of choice made it more of an obscure entry that few of us enjoyed at launch. But is it worth going back to today? Well, honestly, that really depends. The game is still fun and challenging, and slicing up battle droids is something that every Star Wars fan would enjoy, but the game's age is definitely showing through. This title feels like it was more of a mishmash of content thrown together solely for the purpose of more Star Wars merchandise, and whilst the game was definitely still enjoyable, it does does lack some of the quality that we have seen from other Star Wars titles such as Battlefront 2, The Force Unleashed and Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. If you can find a cheap copy and have an Xbox lying around or have other means to give it a go. Meanwhile, I'm going to sue you out of existence. Then it is still worth trying out. I am sure that you will get a kick out of it or at least get a laugh at it. So what were your favorite Obi-Wan moments? Does this title deserve a place on your shelf? If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like as that helps us to keep the lights on. Subscribe if you'd be so kind. And did you know this GTA clone might be the best one? Click the video to find out more. I've been Sam, you've been amazing, and we'll catch you in the next video.